All right, so in this set of slides, I'm going to introduce convolutional neural networks, uh, which have become the, the workhorse for image processing. Okay, so this is uh, an important class of neural networks with a specific architecture that has some properties that are worth understanding and have been key, in fact, to the success uh, of many tasks in, in computer vision. Okay, so when it comes to large data sets, we're going to need some neural networks that can scale. Uh, both in terms of uh, the dimensionality of the data, but also to be able to handle sequences um, uh, that might be fairly long. And so what we're going to talk about this lecture are convolutional neural networks, but then also in the upcoming lectures, recursive networks and, and recurrent networks. Okay, so for convolutional neural networks, their name comes from the name of a mathematical operation known as convolution. So here a convolution is an operation on two functions, x and w. So here I'm using parentheses to emphasize that x is a function that takes an argument. And then same thing, w is a function that takes an argument. So those two functions are going to be modified to produce a third function y, and it can be viewed as essentially just a, a modified version of the original function x. So the idea is we're going to take the function x, we're going to modify it based on a function w, and then we're going to obtain a function y. Now the way we do this modification is going to be based on this operation here. So convolution of x by w is essentially the integral of x times w um, according to this equation. Now sometimes when people talk about convolution they will denote this by um, an operator, the star operator, and then they might represent this by x star w of t, and, and here this does not mean multiplication per se, so the star simply denotes convolution. Okay, so this is what it is mathematically, but then the question is what does that mean, right? So what does a convolution really correspond to? So to illustrate, we're going to draw an example. Um, and at least one important aspect of convolutions is that they can be used for smoothing. Okay, so let's say I've got a function x that looks like this. So this is x of t. So this is a function that is not smooth, so I drew it on purpose this way. Okay, so it's a non-smooth function that has uh, some discontinuities uh, here and there. Now let's say that we want to smooth out x and for this we're going to use a convolution with a weighting function um, that will correspond to the Gaussian function. So here I've got my weighting function, w of i, is going to be k times e to the minus t minus i square divided by 2 sigma square. Okay, so we've talked a lot about Gaussian distributions, Gaussian kernels, Gaussian many things, and we're talking about the Gaussian once more. Uh, in this case, it's, it's a weighting function, and now if I modify the function x based on this weighting function. If we look at the equation that we've got here on the, on the slide, 
So what this equation does is that we can think of it as computing y as some sort of weighted combination of different x's where the weights are defined by w. And here, if w happens to be a Gaussian distribution, right, then we can think of this as some sort of expectation. Right? So it's essentially taking a weighted average of the x's in some neighborhood where the weights are given by w. OK, so in this graph here, when I multiply x by w and then I compute the integral, I will essentially smooth out x. And then I will end up with a function that might look like this. Okay, so this is here um, y of i. Okay, so I guess here for the x-axis, I'm using both t for x of t and then i for y of i. Okay, so, so this shows that we can smooth out this function by using um, the Gaussian function where you see at zero we have the largest weight so it means that when we approximate our function then the point at a certain t will have the largest weight for that t but then the other points on the functions that are nearby they're going to have some uh, some weights that are going to gradually decrease as we go away. Okay, so here this shows um, how we can essentially smooth out the function by using a Gaussian function. Any questions regarding this? Okay, very good. OK, so this was an example of a convolution that is continuous. But sometimes we might have um, a sequence uh, that is discrete as opposed to a function that is continuous. We can still apply the notion of convolution. And then we'll get a discrete convolution where the integral is replaced by a sum. But otherwise, it's the same idea. We multiply x by w. And then we can think of this as some sort of weighted combination of the x's in some neighborhood to obtain y. Now we can also apply convolutions in more than one dimension. So for instance, if we have two dimensions, this will be, in fact, important in the context of images. So we're going to apply convolutions to images. And then we can think of an image as essentially a 2D function that is discrete in the sense that Every pixel is like a measurement of that function at a specific coordinate, specific x, y coordinate. So here, um, I guess my coordinates are going to be denoted by t1 and t2. So t1 could be the x coordinate, t2 could be the y coordinate, and now x could be the pixel intensity. And then w is going to be a weight applied to each pixel intensity so that when I take a weighted combination, then I obtain now a new image that's denoted by y. OK, so here, I guess, uh, yeah, don't be confused. So you can think of x as, like, as our input function, y is our output function, and then the coordinates are t1 and, and t2. And, and now here we have two summations simply because we're in two dimensions. OK, so as a concrete example, we can use convolutions, a very, very simple convolution, to do some edge detection. In particular here, I'm showing you how we can detect vertical edges from a grayscale image. OK, so, in, so okay, here we've got a dog. It's a grayscale image that ranges from white to black um, with 
this. Now, if we take the difference between two adjacent pixels, so here x would be the pixel intensity at coordinates ij, and now this would be the pixel intensity of the previous pixel at coordinate i minus 1 and j. So we're just looking at the pixel that comes right before uh, in the same row. Okay, so if you take the difference, and now pixel intensities are measuring, I guess, um, the degree of, of darkness or the grayscale, right? So if we go from, let's say, white to black, right, then there's going to be an important difference, and that's what's captured here. That's why we see a black edge. And then uh, on the other side, when we go from black to white, then there's also an important difference, and now this time we get a white edge. So in general, you see just by looking at differences of two pixels that are adjacent, we can compute vertical edges. Um, and here it, it works for both directions, from black to white and white to black. Um, and, and that gives us this picture, uh, this figure that, that we see here. And now to achieve this, you see we can use a weighting function w that is equal to 1 for the current pixel, minus 1 for the pixel right before, and 0 for any other pixel. Any questions regarding this? OK, very good. All right, so convolutions can be used then for a bunch of things, but for our purposes, the main uh, usage will be, in fact, to detect features. So here, um, in a neural network, um, a convolution denotes essentially a linear combination of a subset of units based on a specific pattern of weights. So if we consider a neural unit, it, we typically have a linear combination of the inputs. That gives us aj. And then we pass aj through a nonlinear activation function h, which gives us the output. Right? But now, this linear combination, we can think of it as essentially a convolution. It's a convolution because we take the inputs and then we simply um, multiply them by some weights. And then those weights are going to define essentially our filter, our convolutional operator. And then based on this, we'll be able to perhaps detect some features like edges or other patterns that might be salient, that might be important for whatever the task is. OK, so this is essentially a new interpretation of um, units that, at, at some level, I guess, any unit can be thought as, as a convolution. But then the idea is that you see the linear combination when it's applied uh, like this to a small patch in an image, right? then we'll think of it as essentially a convolution that looks at, at a neighborhood and it tries to detect whether a feature is present or not. So in general, you see, you can always take a linear combination of all of the inputs. But now if we restrict that to just a neighborhood, to a window or a patch, right? then we'll think of this as essentially looking for a feature in that neighborhood, doing feature detection. And then the uh, pattern of weights will essentially determine what is the filter to detect that feature. And then the nonlinear activation function will essentially be something that amplifies what the output is, or otherwise regularizes what the output is. But, but then the idea is that we use the, um, a, a pattern of weights to essentially identify the presence or absence of some features in some neighborhood like a patch. OK, so concretely, um, we can look at examples of um, different types of filters that are, in fact, inspired by how the human visual cortex works. Um, so historically, there's an important class of filters known as the Gabor filters. Um, and they have some common feature maps that corresponds to these um, little images. <coughs> OK, so here. Um, those little images, the way to think about them is that whenever 
uh, an image has some gray part, then it would be the same as having a weight that is zero. Whenever it's a white part, the, um, the, the weight would be positive, and whenever it's black, the weight is negative. So now imagine that you've got an image that is an entire scene, and now you'd like to detect little edges, for instance, little edges that might have uh, an, different angles, or they might be vertical, and here you see some of these edges are quite short at the top, much longer at the bottom here. And then in this case here, these little edges might be mostly white, mostly black, uh, different uh, degrees of thickness as well. So you see these are uh, different um, uh, features that essentially we, we might want to, to detect, capture, and you know, build gradually on top of. So, so here are the idea is that um, every little image, there is essentially a patch um, of weights that corresponds to that, and then those weights, their magnitude is given by um, the color, so well, I, I guess the, the level of gray, where zero is just gray, white is positive, black is, is negative. Right? And now you apply this into an image, and then you, you, you check whether in a given patch um, there is a, a corresponding feature or not. That's the idea. Okay, so now let's draw an architecture for a convolutional neural network, and I'll explain in more detail how those patches, how those filters are applied in this architecture in order to compute what we need. Okay, so an example of a convolutional neural network architecture could have at the bottom some inputs, then convolution, uh, then pooling, then convolution again, then pooling, and finally some outputs. Okay, so this is an example of a simple convolutional neural network, and then the key is that in that architecture, we alternate between convolution and pooling layers, convolution, pooling, and so on, and then um, at the end, we might have some additional layers, some dense layers, and, and otherwise the output. Okay, so what typically denotes a convolutional neural network are precisely these convolution and pooling layers that alternate. Okay, so a convolutional layer, if it is 1D, um, might look like this. So here, let's say that I've got uh, five inputs, and then the first three inputs go into the first output, then the next three go into the next one, and then the final three go into the last one, okay? So this would be a 1D um, representation, so a vector. And then from this vector, we're going to compute a convolution that corresponds to another vector. And here, the convolution, we need to have a filter. And what I'm doing here is saying that the, each node is only dependent on three nodes. So essentially, I'm going to have a filter of size 3 where I have the same weights. So here, w1, w2, w3, w1, w2, w3. W1, W2, and W3. 
So the idea is that you see a node has a, a pattern of weights that corresponds to a filter, and this is applied to a window or a patch. So here, when we're in one dimension, right, so it's a window of a fixed size, so here size 3. And then the idea is that the second node is going to reuse the same weights, so essentially the same filter applied to the next window okay, of size 3. And then for the third one, same idea. So it's going to take as input three nodes, and then again with the same pattern of weights. So the idea is that in a convolutional layer, what we do is we feed the inputs, but then instead of connecting every input to every output, we connect only each output to a small window, and then we apply the same filter of weights to every single window to calculate um, a different output. Okay, the benefit of doing this is that now you can see that we have a much sparser representation, so we have fewer connections than if it was fully connected. If this was fully connected, we would have essentially a number of connections that would be the number of inputs times the number of outputs. Now instead, you see we, we only have a fixed number of connections per output. Um, and then also the number of parameters is much smaller. So here we only have three weights. These three weights are shared across uh, the application of, of every filter on, on a different window. So normally, you see the number of weights would be quadratic in the sense of number of inputs times number of outputs. But now we can have something that is much more succinct, much more compact, with only three weights in this particular example. OK, so this is for 1D. Now if we look at 2D, So let's say I've got a 5x5 five five image. And what I'm going to do is take a patch. And let's say it's a patch of size 3x3. Three three. I apply a filter to this patch. And this will allow me to compute one output, which corresponds to the top left cell there. Now, as another example, I can take the bottom right patch that's also 3x3. Three three. Okay, and uh, this will correspond to the bottom right cell. So the idea is that I'm going to have the same weights. Uh, so here, W1, W2, W3, W4, W5, W6, W7, W8, W9 that are applied across um, every application of the filter. So you see those nine weights are going to multiply the nine inputs, take a linear combination, and produce an output here after it goes through an activation function. Now for the bottom part here, same idea. This time I'm going to use here W1, W2, W3, W4, W5, W6, W7, W8, W9, right? So take a linear combination, compute the bottom right cell. So now I will obtain nine outputs simply because if I take a 3x3 three three and I slide it across all the columns and also across all of the rows, right, there are nine possible positions that correspond to these nine outputs. OK, any questions regarding this? Yeah? Uh, in one case, this is not why have just ah, so yeah, so here, this is uh, the point that um, in a convolutional neural network, we reuse the same weights whenever we apply the filter to a different window. So generally speaking, it would, we would have more flexibility if we had different weights. But here the intuition is that let's say that I'm trying to detect an edge in 
uh, some patch and I don't care whether I detect the edge that's in the bottom left part of the image or the top right part of the image then the idea is that I would apply the same filter with the same set of weights everywhere in every single patch of the image and therefore I'm, I'm, I'm reusing those weights everywhere. So here this is not an image, this is 1D, but it's the same idea, let's say it's an audio signal, so it's a temporal signal, right, and now I'm trying to recognize whether a phoneme is present somewhere in a certain uh, region, and then it might be shifted a little bit by time, but I, I don't care so much, so I'm just gonna check whether the pattern is present at different windows. Yeah. Ah, good question, yeah. So since here we're, we're sharing the weights, yeah, what happens to our training algorithm? So here, when we train, right, um, we can use backpropagation. If we're doing backpropagation, it's essentially gradient descent. And it turns out that if we're using a package like TensorFlow or PyTorch or Keras, there's automatic differentiation. And the fact that we have shared weights, it just means that in our function that corresponds to the neural network, we're gonna have the same variable appear multiple times, and then automatic differentiation will still take care of this for us. So we can still compute a gradient, and now when we update a weight, so if I update weight one, then it will effectively update the weight for this edge as well as that edge and that edge, because they have the same weights. Yeah. What is, oh, what is pooling? Okay, yes, so we're gonna talk about this in a second. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Oh, this doesn't work. Okay, yes, so pooling uh, corresponds to a commutative mathematical operation that combines several units. So here are some examples of these commutative mathematical operations are max, sum, product, average, Euclidean norm, and many others. What they all have in common is that the order of the inputs do not matter. If I take the max of a bunch of inputs, I can change the order, the max is still the same. Okay, so pooling is important in convolutional neural network to essentially form some sort of um, local equivariance. So here if I'm trying to detect an edge and I don't care too much about the precise location of the edge, what happens is that I can compute, um, I can compute some feature detection um, like you see here, I apply my uh, feature detector three by three everywhere in the image that correspond that gives me some outputs. And now let's see that whenever I detect the, the the feature, then it produces a high value. And if I don't detect the feature, then the output is something lower. So now if I take the max of these entries, it will give me. Uh, it, it will tell me if this feature was detected anywhere um, inside uh, this map. Okay? So the idea is that pooling allows us to verify whether the presence of a feature, whether a feature is detected somewhere where I don't care too much about the location. And here I'm going to apply um, some uh, pooling filter where again I'm going to look for the max inside the a certain window inside a certain patch, which will allow, um, I guess, a certain invariance with respect to the location of that feature. <coughs> okay, so here's a concrete example of a convolutional neural network for digit recognition. So you guys played with the MNIST data set uh, in the previous assignments. Now, if we want to recognize a digit, um, so we take as input um, a bitmap representation. Okay, so this is an example. 
and, and then the output will be the class that it belongs to, so a label from 0 to 9. Now, the first thing we could do is apply a 5 by 5 convolution, which means that I have my image here, and now I'm going to apply a filter of size 5 by 5, a bit like what I drew on the board here. So I've got here an image. This was a filter of 3 by 3, but now in this context, it was a filter of 5 by 5, which allows me to detect larger features. Okay, so I would apply this uh, across all the columns, all the rows. So if I apply something that's 5 by 5, and then for every 5 by 5 filter, I have one output, and then I move this all across, then I will obtain essentially an output which has uh, a square shape as well, but then the size will be 28 by 28. And this is known as a feature map because it allows me to essentially take my input and then verify the presence or absence of a feature in different locations as I move my patch across all the columns and across all the rows. And then so there's going to be 28 by 28 of those outputs. So a, a feature map of 28 by 28. Now, in practice, I don't want to detect just one feature, but I want to look up maybe many features. So in this picture here, we've got four of those uh, feature maps. So every square is one feature map. This is another feature map. We've got a third one here, and then there's a fourth one here. Okay, so, so these four feature maps essentially correspond to four different features where I'm going to have a different filter, a different pattern of weights that is applied in, uh, as a patch, you know, to, to check whether uh, the, the feature is present. But then you see I'm going to have different patterns of weights for different features, and, and then I can have as many as I want like this. So here in, in this example, there's essentially four feature maps. Um, in the assignment, when you work with convolutional neural networks, you're going to detect 32 feature maps and then eventually 64 feature maps. So in practice, we obviously want to collect lots of features if possible. Okay, so then the next layer is a max pooling layer. So here, uh, we could have used other operations than max, but the, by far the most popular operator is max. And uh, that's in part because of this intuition where if you detect a feature somewhere, then it doesn't matter where we detect it when we take a max. And here, if I have a max for, of size 2 by 2, it means that I take a patch of 2 by 2, take the max of all the entries in that patch, and return one value. So whenever I do this and I look at all the patches that are 2 by 2, then it will reduce from 28 by 28 to 14 by 14, okay? And then I would apply this to each feature map, so that's how I end up with four feature maps. So here again, the intuition is that I have some features, like let's say I'm detecting some edges, and I don't care whether the edge is at a specific location or just shifted by one pixel on the left or the right, so whenever I apply my two by two max pooling, then it will tell me whether that feature is present in, inside that little region. Okay, so once we've done that, now we've essentially detected some basic features, but we don't want to stop there. Maybe we want to detect some higher level features. So then we do another convolution, in this case again 5 by 5. If you apply a 5 by 5 that you shift across all columns and across all rows, then you will end up with some feature maps that are 10 by 10. And now, instead of just obtaining four feature maps, we can obtain, we can select to, to uh, look up for more than just four types of features. So in this example, there would be, I believe, uh, 12, of, 12 features. So this will give us 12 feature maps. And then again, we do max pooling. Um, here, again, the intuition is that, let's say we're doing face recognition, maybe a, some of my feature maps might implicitly correspond to detecting eyes, detecting nose, detecting a mouth. Now the idea is that 
everyone's faces, um, we, we have uh, slightly different shapes and then you know, some people have longer faces, some people wider faces, right? So, so then the position of the eyes, the nose and so on might vary a little bit, so it might be shifted by one or two pixel and then this would allow for this type of uh, variation. Okay, so then we obtain uh, a final set of features here and eventually what we want to do is start classify. So then the second part of the network here is uh, designed for classification. And now in practice we don't really know what's the best architecture for classification. So what is common is just to take a fully connected uh, layer. So here you see we're going to flatten all of those features and then construct a vector of nodes where they're all connected to every feature here. Um, so that's a fully connected layer. And then perhaps we add another layer that corresponds to the output, again fully connected. And then the idea is that the weights for those layers are going to be adjusted to eventually compute the classes. Yeah? The weights of each number is learned by the network, right? That's right. So the weights are learned. Um, as we do backpropagation. So this is the beauty of convolutional neural networks because you see in the feature extraction part we have some weights that correspond to the convolutional filters, right? But these weights are not designed by humans, they're not designed by, by engineers. They, I guess they just get initialized randomly and then as we train our network then we update those weights. Effectively, what the network is doing is to learn to extract features that are rele relevant, and that's the beauty of convolutional neural networks. So, for example, if we want to uh, extract the, feature, uh, the edge, for example, how can we tell network that uh, learn a filter that extracts edges? Or, because we know the shape of the filter that uh, extracts edges, right? How can we tell the network that the shape of the filter that we learn should be like this or that? Okay, yeah, so that's a great question. Yeah, how can we ask our network to learn precisely a feature like, a, like an edge? And the answer is we don't, okay? <laughs> we, we, we essentially let the network decide for itself what might be the best features. And this was essentially, you know, a big mental block for researchers uh, at the beginning because for decades people you know, became uh, quite good at handcrafting different types of filters that corresponded to specific types of features and then they wanted to make sure that their network was essentially computing the right type of features. But the reality is that as humans, despite uh, how much belief we have in, in our abilities to construct features, we don't construct good features. Okay, so it's better to let the machine do the optimization and essentially come up with the weights, come up with the features, and maybe the drawback is that then the features are not as easily interpretable, but they work better in practice. Okay, so how does this a different feature maps differ with each other? How, how can you say that, okay, this is one feature map, this is another feature map? Okay, so each feature map, the idea is that we, we have a, a, a pattern of weights, right? So uh, we have uh, some weights like this, okay? And the idea is that for each feature map, there's going to be a different set of weights. So now when the network evolves, because these are different variables, right? Then they will change in ways that will uh, be different over time and will end up corresponding to different features. But it's true that there is a risk that if uh, they get initialized too closely to each other, they might converge to exactly computing the same thing, and then it means that our network could be shrinked by removing one feature map. But generally speaking, the idea is that with um, random initialization and the way we train by feeding in images at random as well for the order, right, then they will tend to uh, evolve in a way where they remain different. That's right, so we don't know a priori what features the network is going to uh, learn and, and use and, and treat as, as important. So yeah, so as engineers, you know, this is scary, right? But it works, and it works better than when we tell it this is what you need to do, 
Okay, so uh, it's, it's the beauty of optimization and the beauty of having a data-driven solution here. Okay, so convolutional neural networks have the following benefits. So in practice, um, they end up having sparse connections, sparse interactions, and this is best illustrated with uh, this example here, where you see I've got three outputs, five inputs. Normally, if this was fully connected, right, I would have three times five, so 15 edges and then 15 weights. But instead, every node only has three connections, so it's, uh, so it's, it's much smaller, and then the total number of weights is just three weights, right? So, so in that sense, it's sparse. Um, and now if we consider an image, right, and we're looking, let's say, at three by three patches, it means that every uh, output is only connected to three by three pixels, to nine pixels instead of the entire image, which might be 100 by 28 by 128. Okay, so it's a lot sparser. Um, also, yeah, in, in terms of parameters, there's fewer weights. Um, in part because it's, it's sparsely connected, but also because we share the weights, right? So every filter in a feature map essentially uses the same weights. And then finally, with the max pooling, or otherwise the pooling layers, then we can obtain some equivariant representation, and these tend to be invariant with respect to translations, and then they can also help to handle inputs of varying length. Okay, any questions regarding this? All right. Okay, so when we define uh, an architecture for a convolutional neural network, the convolutional layer, um, very often we would specify the following parameters. So there would be a parameter for the number of filters. That's essentially an integer that indicates how many feature maps we're gonna compute. Um, there's also a parameter that corresponds to the kernel size, so that's essentially the window size or the patch size, so it has a width and a height. Uh, there's also a stride. This is a tuple that indicates whenever we, we shift a kernel, do we shift it just by one um, in every uh, direction, uh, or do we shift by two or by three or by some larger number of, of, of inputs. Okay, so, so often we'll, we'll use a stride that might be more than just one, um, and then this will allow us to obtain uh, some computation that is sparser. Um, okay, the other, the last parameter is known as padding. So sometimes what happens is that we have some input of a certain size, and now we want to get an output of exactly the same size. And the problem is whenever I, I, I use a patch, a filter of a certain size, right, then obviously the output is going to be of a, a size that is slightly smaller simply because, um, you know, if I have a three by three, um, I, I can only do so many of those three by threes going left and going up. Um, but then I can get around this by doing some padding, so I can add around the image, I can add some zeros to pad, and then I can make sure that I'll have enough of those filters whenever I slide across and uh, from bottom to top um, to correspond to the uh, desired output. Okay, so let's do a couple of examples just to illustrate how those parameters work, and this will help you to understand as well for the assignment when you work with convolutional neural networks. Uh, what are the parameters that are used to define convolutional layers? <coughs> okay. Okay, so let's say that I've got a kernel, 
uh, which is 2 by 2, with a stride which is 1 by 1, and then padding equal to valid. OK, so here, if I have an input, which is 3 by 3, then what I will do is apply a kernel, which is of size 2 by 2. So I will uh, create patches of size 2 by 2, which will give me an output here of size 2 by 2, because this produces the first one. And then if I look at the bottom right corner here, then there's another patch of 2 by 2 that produces this one. Okay, and then I can, I, and then with the stride that is one, it means that whenever I shift my patch to, to the right, I would shift it by one, so that's how I can get two entries like this, and then stride one by one, so that means when I shift down, I will also find another, um, I will simply shift down by one, and I will find another row, so that's how I get a second row here. <coughs> OK. Um, and then here, with padding equals to valid, it means that I'm not doing any padding. And then the output will necessarily have a smaller size than the input. Any questions regarding this? OK. Good. Um, OK, the next one. So let's have a kernel. Again, that's 2 by 2. Um, actually, no. Let's have a kernel that's 3 by 3. A stride that is 1 by 1. And this time, padding will be equal to same. So if I've got a 3 by 3 image, so here with padding same, it means that the output is going to be the same size as the input. So I'm going to want to create also a 3 by 3. But now, how can I create a 3 by 3 if my kernel size is 3 by 3? So here, I'm going to have to create some padding around. Okay which will make it become essentially a 5 by 5. Okay, And the idea is that the padding around is going to be filled up with zeros. So these are all going to be 0. And now you can see that I can take a patch that's 3 by 3. That gives me the first entry. Then there's another patch here that's 3 by 3 that gives me the second entry. And then a third patch that's 3 by 3 here that gives me the third entry. OK, let's do one last example. Um, for this one, let's just change the stride to be 2 by 2. So let's say that I've got a 4x4 four four as input. So now I will get an output, which is just 2x2. Two two. Um, so with a kernel size, that is 2x2. Two two. OK, so this will give me the first entry. But now when I shift my filter, I'm going to shift it by two entries. So it's going to go here. Okay, so then essentially this part 
will give me the second entry. And then same thing when I shift down. So here it's two by two, so that means when I shift down, I also shift by two. Okay, any questions regarding this? Okay, very good. Okay, so when it comes to training convolutional neural networks, as we were discussing just before, the training is going to work in the same way as any neural network. So we're going to do backpropagation, which means we're going to do gradient descent, and then we can compute the gradient by automatic differentiation. The main difference is that now, whenever we um, think of our neural network as a mathematical function, where the weights are variables and we compute the derivative, then since the weights are shared, it means that some variables are going to appear multiple times into our function, but from the perspective of computing a partial derivative, this is no big deal, right? We know how to compute a partial derivative of a function if a variable appears multiple times in that function. So, so yeah, so that's the main difference. And other than that, we're just going to take steps in the direction of the gradient, and then the algorithms that we've seen before like Adam, stochastic gradient descent, uh, RMS prop, and so on, uh, can all apply. Okay, so with everything that we've seen so far, you might be wondering now, when I design a neural network, what's the right architecture? Okay, and this is the one million dollar question. Okay, so in fact, a lot of the work, both in academia and the industry, is about designing better architectures. That's what a lot of people spend a lot of time on, and, and part of the reason is that it's an art more than a science. Okay, so, so coming up with the right architecture is problem dependent, and, and then it's never obvious what might work and what might not work. That being said, there are some tricks or some rules of thumbs that have shown good results, and in particular, here, um, there was, um, in 2014, um, a special architecture proposed by the Visual Geometry Group, so VGG at Oxford, and, and then they proposed um, that what we could do is simply have a stack of small filters uh, as opposed to a single large filter in order to obtain fewer parameters and also a deeper network. Okay, so let's draw a picture for this. Okay, so let's say I've got my inputs. Um, and then convolution, pooling, convolution, pooling, and then output. So what is tempting to do is to create convolutions that are going to have a large filter because then they can capture more important features. So here, um, it would be tempting here to use filters that are of size, let's say, 7 by 7. Okay. So in fact, in the early days, there were large filters of size 11 by 11 uh, and, and um, I guess all the way down to, to 3 by 3. So, so here 7 by 7 is uh, an interesting size. Now it means that we're going to have essentially a patch that is of size 49, but what we could do is simply replace that by um, a stack of smaller filters. Oops, so this should be input. So 
So what if we replace a large filter by a stack of a few convolutions? Okay, and now I'm going to make each one of them 3 by 3. So essentially this corresponds to this. And then after that, pooling. And then again, this convolution is going to be replaced by three convolutions. where this one corresponds to this. Again, 3 by 3, 3 by 3, 3 by 3. And then we have pooling at the top. And then the output after that. So now, if I replace this, what happens is that now, um, whenever I have a 7 by 7, So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let me add one more, seven. OK, so here's a seven by seven. OK, so it's a fairly large filter. And I could replace that instead. So normally, you see, here, whenever I've got a convolution at 7 by 7, this will produce just one entry. Okay? But instead, I could have, oops, let me ma not make it so big. Let's have, again, my 7 by 7. Okay? So now if I create uh, some 3x3 three three filters, this will shrink to 5x5. Five five. Uh, let me make this a bit bigger. OK, so this is the first 3x3. Three three. It goes down to 5x5. Five five. Then after this, it will go down to three by three, and finally to just one. Okay, so effectively what I'm doing is I'm replacing a large filter that maps seven by seven by one to a, lar uh, to a, a stack of smaller filters that gradually go down to just one and three. Okay, now if you count the number of parameters, okay, so here we need 49 parameters. Here, in this case, we're going to need nine parameters. So to go from here to here, we just need three by three. So that's nine parameters. There's another nine parameters. And then there's another nine parameters. Right? So there's going to be three times nine, so 27 parameters. Whereas here, we need 49 parameters. So there's fewer parameters, and then on top of that, we go deeper. Depth, in general, helps. Um, after every convolution, if we wish to, we can have an activation, a nonlinear activation that can do a nonlinear transformation. So often, this works better. Okay, so this is a simple rule of thumb where, in general, when it comes to the size of the filters, smaller filters tend to be better and then you just stack more of them, they'll have essentially the same receptive field in terms of input to produce one output. OK, let's stop here, and we'll continue next class. All right, so when we talk about neural networks, um, an important uh, question that everyone has is often, how do you design a good architecture for a given application, right? So 
Um, we talked about how um, smaller filters are often useful, but now another important rule of thumb that uh, has been quite successful in terms of designing um, effective architectures is the use of, of what are known as residual layers, including residual connections or also known as skip connections. Okay, so this was proposed in 2015 um, by some researchers who in fact entered um, the um, uh, ImageNet challenge and then ended up uh, producing what is known as, as a ResNet, so a residual network. And then uh, it won the challenge that year. And more than that, so uh, there was a, a whole suite of benchmarks where they managed to improve the results. So this was quite significant, and it meant that you know, there were some ideas there that were quite fun, foundational in, in terms of improving the results. Okay, so the, the, the key idea here is this idea of um, using some skip connections to shorten paths into some deep networks. So we talked about VGG, um, which is a, a neural network that um, essentially replaces large filters with stacks of smaller filters and essentially increases the depth. In general, depth, um, deeper networks are seen as, as better in general, but then they will um, make the uh, gradient vanishing problem worse. Okay, so even if you use rectified linear units, they can mitigate the gradient vanishing problem, but still there comes a point where if you just keep on stacking more layers to your network, the quality of your network will degrade and, and then performance will get worse. So an interesting question is, can we keep on stacking layers and still make sure that uh, the, the quality won't degrade? And perhaps a simple idea for this is that maybe we could design an architecture where when we add more layers, right, then the network has essentially the option to either use those additional layers or ignore them so that if they're going to hurt, then it can just ignore them, and then the, the quality is still going to be good. So, so this is what was proposed essentially um, in a, a residual network where there's some connections that essentially will skip some of those additional layers so that if they're not gonna be useful, then um, it won't hurt the network. And then another way of looking at those skip connections is that because they bypass certain layers, they essentially create shortcuts into the network that effectively reduce the depth. So now if you've got a gradient vanishing problem, well, even though there are some paths that are quite long, the paths that use those residual or skip connections tend to be shorter, and then they propagate the gradient more effectively. Okay, so let's draw a picture to illustrate what that means concretely. Okay, so the idea behind uh, the use of residual connections is that, let's say we've got some input X it feeds into, uh, let's say, some convolution with pooling. Okay, and perhaps we have uh, two of those in a row. Then the output, let's call that f of x. So maybe we're not sure whether these layers are useful or doing something uh, that improves uh, the accuracy. So one option could be to create a connection that essentially skips those and then will simply be added to uh, those layers. So here, this additional connection could simply use an identity activation function, so essentially um, it, it simply propagates x. 
So, so here, in fact, there's, there, there are no weights. It's just an identity function that propagates x, so that now the output here will be f of x plus x. Okay. So in this fashion, you see, if we initialize the weights um, in a certain way for uh, these layers so that they produce perhaps something that is close to 0, then 0 plus x would just be x. So in, in the worst case, you see we're going to have an output that um, essentially ignores those layers. So, so now this is giving the option to the network when it's being optimized to ignore those layers if it wishes to, but otherwise if it's going to find them useful, then it can use them still, and, and then so it kind of gets uh, uh, the choice and, and then it can optimize that better. Any questions regarding this? Okay, so, so this is um, the um, idea behind residual connection. Now, in a full network, we might have um, a structure that, that looks like this, where there's the input. And now, perhaps we have some stacks of convolutions plus pooling. And then, let's say another stack of convolution plus pooling. And then this would keep on going. OK, and now we can create these skip connections like this that each use the identity. And now the idea is that you can stack a lot of layers. You don't have to worry too much about whether your network is going to start degrading because with those skip connections, then um, it can simply use what um, came as input um, without affecting the overall accuracy. So, so now, uh, typically in practice, you would have stacks that can be quite high. Um, so when ResNet was proposed, then uh, the number of layers was increased into the hundreds, and today now even into the thousands. So you can imagine having like this hundreds or thousands of layers, and then perhaps um, every pair of layer, then you introduce a skip connection like this. And, and then this effectively reduces the depth, at least along the path of the skip connection, which helps with respect to the gradient vanishing problem. And also it ensures that if, if some of the layers are not going to be useful, then they can be ignored by the, uh, uh, the network. OK, any questions regarding this? Yes? Um, when we propagate error through these skip connections, um, like I thought the idea was that the gradient going that's changing the weights on like going into one unit. It actually like the relative sizes of the gradients actually correspond to the error contributed by those. Uh, the skip connection is not actually propagating like the signal isn't propagating error information. It's just sort of like increasing the norm of the gradients. How is this not like damaging the training? And, and why can't we just scale the grade like take all the gradients for one layer and just normalize them? So they all have, always have normal and do this for every layer. Like why is that not? OK, so, so the skip connections are not changing the scale of the gradient per se, right? because it's the identity function. So whenever you do automatic differentiation through this, right, it's, it's a bit the same as if you know, we, we were plugging in the input directly here. Right? So, um, so yeah, so I, I, I don't see why those connections would impact the size of, well, the, the magnitude of, of the gradient. Um, it's, yeah, and, and then for your idea of normalizing, this is indeed a, a good idea. So there's another approach that we haven't discussed, which is known as batch normalization, 
that often also mitigates the gradient vanishing problem. And here the idea of batch normalization is that you have, let's say, at a certain point into your network, um, some um, computation that has been taken place so far, and, and now the vectors that feed into the rest of the network, they might be shifted in terms of magnitude, either they get large or they get small, and, and now it helps if we can essentially renormalize them. Uh, so batch normalization essentially means that you normalize these values according to um, whatever batch of data that, that you have. And typically you would center this at zero with a, a variance of one. And, and then you would do this um, for each dimension separately. So, so then it, it helps in, in, in that respect. So that's another heuristic that, that is often used. But yeah, we, we haven't talked about this. Yeah. OK, any other questions? Okay, so for the gradient vanishing problem, the idea is that you see, if I look at the depth of this network, right, then if I consider uh, the normal path, right, uh, so here this would have like one, two, three, four layers, and let's say five layers for, for the output. Okay, so this, this is not a very deep network in this case because that's what I drew. But now if you look at the depth, when we go through the skip connections, right, so we would have one, two, and then three. So there would be, it, it would be, you see, a, a shorter path. And then, in general, shorter paths help to propagate the gradient uh, faster. So you mean we, uh, we do backpropagation on both passes? Yes, so we do backpropagation on the entire network, which include both paths. And here, the backpropagation, I mean, the idea is that you use automatic differentiation. And then this is a network that encodes a mathematical function that, and that mathematical function includes, I guess, these identity skip connections. So uh, gradient would be propagated automatically through those as well. <coughs> yeah. When we do back propagation, this deep network, the, this one part is still there, right? Like, how are we still avoiding the Mm -hmm. Yeah, so obviously the, the gradient that would go through the long path, right, is going to vanish faster than the one that goes through a shorter path. But now the idea is that let's say we want to update some of the weights down here, okay, then um, the gradient is going to get back propagated through all the paths together simultaneously. Uh, what comes through the, the longer path is probably going to vanish more, so it's going to have a small contribution. But what goes through these skip connections is going to have a greater contribution. And then overall, you see it's the sum of those contributions that determine the magnitude of the gradient. So as long as you have some shorter paths, then it helps. Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, let's continue. OK, so to summarize, when we talk about convolutional neural networks, um, they can be used, obviously, in computer vision. They were motivated by image processing. But then they can be used for more than just computer vision. So in fact, any application where there's going to be sequential data, spatial data, or also tensor patterns. And here the point is that convolutional neural networks, right? we define filters. They are applied locally. They do some form of feature extraction. So that's something fairly general. And whenever you've got data that is sequential, like let's say in speech recognition, also in natural language processing, then you can uh, apply a convolutional neural network. But now we don't have to consider just 1 and 2D data. So in text, it tends to be 1D. In computer vision, it tends to be 2D. But then there are other problems where you might have more than two dimensions. And then at that point, the data would be stored in tensors. So here, tensor stands for multidimensional array. 
And, and then uh, the framework TensorFlow essentially comes from this idea that now we want to do computation with respect to multidimensional arrays. And um, it's, it's not restricted to just vectors or matrices that would be 1 and, and 2D, OK? Um, so yeah, so in terms of applications for, for tensors, well, I guess if we look at video sequences, then now you have essentially something that is 3D. And then uh, there's some other applications that, that might be possible. It's not as common, but uh, it, 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 it happens once in a while.